All right, class, picking up from where we left off, this is uh, the next slide. We're just going into details on uh, the output rate, the fixed cost, variable cost, total cost, marginal cost, which is the increase, or in this case, uh, you know, you see that number dipping down for a period of time. Then you have your average fixed cost, your average variable cost, and then your average total dollar cost. Marginal cost is the increase in cost resulting from the production of one extra unit of output. So if you look at this in the context of like a burger chain, you know, that first burger you make is a $2 million burger, whatever the store cost. But each one of those next incremental burgers are significantly less. Because fixed cost does not change as the firm's level of output changes, marginal cost is equal to the increase in variable cost or the increase in total cost that results from one extra unit of output. Uh, therefore, uh, that can be measured as uh, the change in variable cost divided by the change in quantity or change in total cost divided by change in quantity. You can see that right here. Uh, average total cost. Uh, average uh, total cost is the firm's total cost divided by the level of its output. Average fixed cost is the fixed cost divided by the level of output. And then average variable cost, the variable cost divided by the level of output. De uh, determinants of short run costs. The change in variable cost is the per unit cost of the extra labor with times the amount uh, of extra labor needed to produce that extra output. So, you know, how much more labor did you need to get in order to increase production? Um, and that's seen there in that same chart uh, formula. Uh, the extra labor needed to obtain an extra uh, unit of output is change in labor, labor divided by change in quantity. Uh, diminishing marginal returns and marginal cost. Diminishing marginal returns means that the marginal product, product of labor declines as the quantity of labor employed increases. You know, why this works in practice as well as in theory is because when you're managing more and more people, you know, effectively you, effectively, you hit a wall. It becomes much more difficult to manage that uh, labor. As a result, uh, when there are diminishing marginal returns, marginal cost will increase as output increases, meaning you're not going to get that cost benefit from adding the labor at all. In the first graph, the x-axis ranges from 0 to 11, and the y-axis ranges from 0 to 400. A curved label T C that is inverted, S-shaped is the is uh, above a similar curve labeled VC. The uh, variable cost curve passes through point A at seven and one seventy five, at which uh, a dashed tangent line intersects the origin. A horizontal dashed line labeled FC is known as fixed cost, shown at value of fifty on the y-axis. In the second graph, the x-axis shows that same zero for eleven. Uh, ranging from 0 to 100 on the y-axis, um, three upward uh, open curves labeled average variable cost, average total cost, and marginal cost intersects each other, and a vertical dashed line from the graph above passes through at 7, um, at the value of 7, to the uh, x-axis. A horizontal dashed line is shown at 25 on the y-axis and intersects average variable cost and marginal cost curves at 0.725. A dashed curve labeled average fixed cost passes through the dashed vertical line, as you can see here. Uh, that will be more important in the coming slides. Um, average marginal relationship, and this should make the last slide more clear. The marginal average uh, costs uh, are another example of the average marginal relationship described in Chapter 6, because the average total cost is the sum of average variable cost and average fixed cost, the average fixed cost curve declines everywhere. So as you're getting improvements or efficiencies or productivity in labor, it decreases um, that average fixed cost. It's, you're squeezing more out of that asset. The vertical distance between average total cost and average variable cost curves decreases as output increases. So you, know, you effectively see those lines um, get closer and closer to touching. Theoretically, they never touch because um, there's always going to be that fixed cost. 
Total cost is a flow. Uh, the firm produces a certain number of units per year, thus its total cost is a flow. For example, some uh, numbers of dollars per year. For simplicity, we will often drop the time reference and refer to the total cost in dollars and output in units. Uh, knowledge of short-run costs is particularly important for firms that operate in an environment in which demand conditions fluctuate considerably. And we talked about this a little bit in class. If the firm is currently producing at a level of output at which marginal cost is sharply increasing, if the demand may increase in the future, management may want to expand production uh, capacity to avoid higher costs. So, you know, why do you get that diminishing marginal return? You've hired too many chefs in one kitchen. They're not going to be able to produce as much. So, you know, what it's asking here is, you know, do you increase the facility? Um, short run costs of aluminum melting. This is just a basic example here. Uh, production of aluminum begins with uh, <clears throat> mining. Uh, the process used to separate the oxygen and atoms called smelting is the, pro is the most costly step in producing aluminum. The expenditure on a smelting plant, although substantial, is a sunk cost and can be ignored. Fixed costs are relatively small and can almost be ignored. And then from there, it's just labor. How many hands are you using to extract the labor, uh, extract the aluminum from the ground? Um, so you see here the x-axis ranges from 300 to 900 uh, and the y from 1100 to 1300. The horizontal line at 1140 uh, from 0 to 600 and 1140 to 200 from 600 to 900 is labeled average variable co uh, cost. You're seeing this mostly because it's showing like if you want to produce that much more aluminum here, you have to pay your workers more hours. And you can only increase the hours so much without paying overtime. That's really what this graph is showing us here. The horizontal line 1140 from uh, from 0 to 600 and from 1300 from 600 to 900 is labeled marginal cost. The vertical line from 1140 to 1300 at 600 and a vertical dashed line from 1200 onward is shown. All right, user cost of capital, you know, in this environment with rates going up, um, cost of capital is seen to be increasing. Um, Annual cost of owning and using a capital asset equal to the economic depreciation plus foregone interest. You know, what could you have done if you just put this money in a bank account? What would it have cost you? So this is going to be uh, probably an important term um, for our next exam. But user cost of capital is economic depreciation plus interest rate times value of capital. Um, we can also express the user cost of capital as a rate per dollar of capital of R equals depreciation plus interest rate. Cost minimizing input choices. This is like between man and machine, labor and machine. You know, we can now uh, turn to fundamental problems that all firms face, how to select inputs to produce a given output at a minimum cost. We discussed this with McDonald's, how they're making efficiencies with technology in, to, in order to improve output with labor. Um, price capital. In the long run, the firm can adjust the amount of capital it uses. The firm must decide prospectively how much capital to obtain. You know, this is how some companies can also get into trouble where they can't accurately predict how much cash they may need in the future. In order to compare the firm's expenditures on capital with its ongoing cost of labor, we want to express this capital expenditure as a flow in dollars per year. Um, and then we see that formula below the price of capital is its user's cost given by R plus depreciation, uh, R equals depreciation plus interest rate. Rental rate of capital, rental rate is cost per year of renting one unit of capital. So just think about this as instead of owning the capital, you're renting it. You're, and this might happen with construction companies. You're building a one-off skyscraper. You might rent a good deal of equipment because you don't need the skyscraper equipment all that often. ISO cost line, the graph showing all possible combinations of labor and capital that can be purchased uh, for a given total cost. So you have $100 million. What is the combination of labor and technology that you can use in order to minimize your total cost is what the ISO cost line helps measure and visualize. Formula for this is not as important um, as understanding the concept. Uh, the points L sub 2 and L sub 1 and L sub 3 are marked on the x-axis and the points K sub 3, K sub 1, and K sub 2 are marked on the y-axis. Uh, three lines labeled C sub 0, C sub 1, and C sub 2 are parallel to each other 
and connect values on the y-axis, the values on the x-axis. The line C sub 1 connects 0, uh, comma k sub 2 and points to the x-axis. A curve labeled Q sub 1 intersects the line C sub 2 at points L sub 2, comma k sub 2 and L sub 3, comma k sub 3. Uh, line C sub 1 is tangent to the curve at that point A with coordinates L sub 1, comma k sub 1. Um, so that uh, spot right there where the, it touches is going to be the lowest cost. Um, facing isocost uh, curve C, the firm produces output of Q1 at a point A using L1 units of labor and K of technology. So you see that where it touches that line, that's the point of the lowest cost labor. When price of labor increases, the ISO cost curves become steeper. Output Q is now produced at point B on ISO cost curve by uh, C2 using L2 units of labor and K2 units of capital. We call that in our analysis, uh, production technology, uh, we showed that the marginal rate of technical substitution of labor, MRT, MRTS, the marginal rate of substitution, is the negative of the slope of the ISO uh, quant and is equal to the ratio of marginal products of labor and capital. So MRTS equals marginal product of labor divided by the marginal cost. Uh, marginal cost of labor and the marginal product of capital. It follows that when the firm minimizes the cost of producing a particular output, the following conditions hold as below. <clears throat> the effects of effluent fees on input choices. An effluent fee is a per unit fee that the steel firm must pay for uh, for the effluent that the goes into the river. So think about this as a chemo chemical cleanup costs or an environmental cost. Uh, when the firm is not charged for dumping wastewater, it chooses to produce a given output of 10,000 uh, of wastewater and 2,000 of machine hours of capital. However, the effluent fee raises the cost of wastewater, shifts the ISO cost curve from FC to DE, and causes the firm to produce a at point B, a process that results in much less effluent. So yeah, what this is saying here is that if you tax pollution, you will get less of it. Or if you charge people for pollution, you will get less of it. Think about, you know, when you recycle like a, an aluminum can, you get a nickel. That should probably be raised. I feel like not enough people save aluminum cans for that nickel anymore. Cost in the long run. Expansion path curve passing through points of tangency between firm's ISO cost lines and its ISO quants. The firm can hire labor at $10 an hour in rent capital for 20 an hour. Given these input costs, we have drawn three of the firm's ISO cost lines. Each ISO cost line is a given for the following equation. And that's just simply $10 an hour times units of labor, $20 an hour times units of capital. The expansion path is a straight line with a slope equal to, uh, and there's a formula rejiggered there, equals 0 0.5. Change in capital over change in labor. Uh, to move from expansion path uh, to the cost curve, we must follow the steps. Choose an output level represented by an isoquant, then find the point of tangency, that's when it touches, of that isoquant with the iso cost line. From the chosen iso cost line, determine the minimum cost of producing and uh, the output level that has been selected, and then graph the output cost combination, as we see in uh, figure 7.6, letter B. First expansion path and long run total cost curve. Uh, in A, the expansion path illustrates the lowest cost combinations of labor and capital that can be used to produce each level of output. We've talked about this a few times now. In B, the corresponding long run total cost curve measures the least cost of producing each level of output, which is an important decision for a lot of businesses when you're trying to figure out what's the most efficient way we can build XYZ. You know, if you're building a ship, a car, a boat, should we use manual labor or should we use automation? It really depends on how much manual labor costs versus how much automation costs. Reducing the use of energy. So greater energy efficiency can be achieved if capital is substituted for energy. 
Um, this is shown as a movement along isoquant Q1 from point A to point B with capital increasing from K1 to K2 and energy decreasing from E2 to E1. Uh, you could look at this one as uh, buying a better engine that's more fuel efficient. If you buy a better engine that's more fuel efficient, you're likely to see other marginal costs or variable costs like energy drop. Technical, technological change uh, implies that the same output can be produced for a smaller amount of inputs. Again, using the gasoline example, you've seen miles per gallon in cars dramatically improve over the last 20 years. You know, that's a, will drive outputs higher. It allows us to move more with less energy. And this is just another visual example of that. Long run versus short run cost curves. The inflexibility of short run production. So, you know, as we discussed in class, you can't change a whole lot in the short run. Many things can be changed in the long run, but in the short run, you have very little flexibility on what can change. Long run average cost. In the long run, the ability to change the amount of capital allows the firm to reduce costs. Um, we talked about the renovation of McDonald's. You know, in the short run, they lose money. In the long run, they'll make way more money because they don't need to hire as much labor. The most important determinant of the sh shape of the long run average cost and marginal cost curves is the relationship between the scale of the firm's operations and the inputs that are required to minimize costs. Some firms aren't able to automate as easy as McDonald's might be able to. You know, when you think about something like Target or Walmart, they still require much more human capital or human labor in order to um, produce an output because of the nature of their business and technology hasn't advanced in such a way where shelves can be automatically stocked in a cost efficient manner. So long run average cost curve is curve relating to average cost of production to output when all inputs including uh, capital are variable. Short run average cost curve, curve relating to the average cost of production to output when the level of capital is fixed. Then long run marginal cost curve, curve showing that the uh, change in total uh, long run cost as output is increased by an incremental unit of one. When a firm is producing at an output at which the long run average cost is falling, the long run marginal cost is less than long run average cost. So if you see falling long-term prices, it's because marginal prices are falling. Conversely, if it's increasing, then marginal costs are increasing. You know, for an efficient, scalable business, you want to see decreasing costs. Like the more business you do, um, the cheaper it gets. You know, you could say, you know, in my business, probably up until you get like one to 200 clients, there's very powerful long-run average cost curves. But if I get 300, 400 clients, I'm going to need to ramp up my hiring and my fixed costs and variable costs to service those accounts. It won't be easy for someone, one person to do all that. You need more people. Economies and diseconomies of scale. Uh, economies of scale have long run costs decreasing and diseconomies of scale see long run average costs increasing. Um, this can happen for following re reasons. If the firm operates on a larger scale, workers can specialize. Scale can uh, provide flexibility. You can get more buying power, and the firm may be able to acquire some production inputs at a lower cost because it is buying them in large quantities. Example of that is how um, Walmart brought, uh, bought uh, trucking companies in order to manage their inventory. Long run average cost curve, so a economy of scale situation which output can be doubled for less than doubling the costs, and diseconomies is effectively the opposite. A firm enjoys economies of scale when it can double its output for less than twice the cost. The term economies of scale includes increasing returns to scale as a special case, but it is more general because it reflects input proportions that change the firm's level of production. So be familiar with these terms for a next exam as well. Economies of scale are often measured in terms of uh, cost, output, elasticity. We're seeing that here. C, uh, EC relates to our traditional measures of cost. Rewrite the equation. Change in cost over change in quantity. Or marginal cost over average cost would be the formula. When it's equal to one, um, in that case, costs are increasingly proportional with output, meaning you get one in, one out. 
and there are either neither economies or diseconomies of scale. When there are economies of scale, um, the marginal cost is less than the average cost it is less than one. So that's how I would frame this for a quiz. You know, if we see that number is less than one, what does that mean? It has economies of scale greater than one. The effect of F1 fleas on uh, input choices. So it's like about Tesla's electric cars that cost around 85,000, um, starting price about 35 grand. To, to achieve such dramatic reduction in price, the economy, uh, the company will rely on scale of batteries. So the more batteries they make, the cheaper they get is the theory here. So how can they stay in business? Is that, well, we need to make more Teslas. Making more Teslas will make them cheaper and then therefore make them profitable, at least in theory in this example. Um, they actually have to achieve that technical efficiency in order to get the prices to fall. Uh, long run cost with economies and diseconomies of scale. Long run average cost in, is the envelope of the short term average cost curves. With economies and diseconomies of scale, the minimum points of the short run average cost curves do not lie on the point of long run average cost. Product transformation curves, curves that showing various combinations of two different outputs that can be, be produced with a given set of inputs. So, you know, trying to think of a decent example here, but you know, like a, a metal can make a truck or it can make a car or it can make a plane or it can make a shed, right? You know, what is the most valuable way to use those inputs in an economy? Here's some more important keyboard, uh, keywords that we'll likely focus on a future exam. So economies of scope, situation in which output, uh, in which joint output of a single firm is greater than output that could be achieved by two different firms when each produces a single product. Diseconomies of scope is the opposite of that, uh, situation in which output of a single firm is less than could be achieved by separate firms when each uh, produces a single product. And then there's also a degree of economies of scope. I will not have you uh, memorize or use this equation, uh, but to measure, the, at, at least for an exam, uh, to measure the degree to which there are economies of scope, we should ask what percentage of cost of production is saved when two or more products are produced jointly rather than individually. So how does this work in the trucking industry? In the trucking business, several related products can be offered depending on the size and load and length of the haul. This range of possibilities raises questions about both economies of scale and economies of scope. The scale questions ask whether large scale direct hauls are more profitable than individual hauls by smaller trucks. And the scope questions ask whether the, a large trucking firm enjoys cost advantages in operating direct quick hauls and in direct slower hauls. Because larger firms can carry sufficiently large truckloads, there is usually no advantage to stopping at an intermediate terminal to fill up a partial load. Because other disadvantages are associated with management of very large firms, the economies of scope get smaller as a firm gets bigger. Meaning when you get bigger, it's hard to be specialized. You can't be as specialized or boutique or niche when you, know, you get bigger, if you want to think about it a little bit more simply. Dynamic change in cost, the learning curve. So it's looking at cost curves here in a more general fashion. When you think about the cost curve of training a new employee, you can get more efficiency out of someone with two years experience than you can with someone with three months experience. So depending on the, let's just say tenure of your labor, that can drive efficiency, drive production down, drive average and variable cost down as well. So the learning curve graphs uh, relating amount of inputs needed by a firm to produce each unit of output to its cumulative output. So um, you could have workers take advantage, take longer to accomplish uh, or shorter to accomplish tasks. Managers learn to schedule production processes more effectively and efficiently. Um, engineers become more confident and suppliers may learn how to process materials better. Going back to that battery example. So showing here a learning curve, right? First time you do a task, it takes you a long time. The hundredth time you've done a task, it takes you a lot quicker. A firm's average cost of production can decline over time because of growth. 
of sales when increasing uh, returns are present. It can decline because there is a learning curve. There was a housing company I followed that was moving very fast and they were increasing their sales team at a very rapid rate. You know, because of this, the new sales team members, you know, did not sell as well as older team members. That can be a cost of a high growth environment. A firm is producing machine tools uh, that tools knows that its labor requirement per machine for its first 10 machines is one. The minimum labor required uh, requirement A is equal to zero, and the beta is effectively equal to 0.32, and it's shown here in the graph below. Learning curve effects important in is important in determining the shape of long-run cost curves and thus can help guide management decisions. Managers can use learning curve information to decide whether a production operation is profitable and if so, how to plan how large the plant should be. So you're not only looking at efficiency of labor, but also you know, how big can you grow. Cost function. Function relating to cost of produ production to the level of output and other variables that the firm can control. A variable cost curve for the automobile industry. An empirical estimate of variable cost curve uh, that can be obtained by using data for individual firms for an industry. So you want to see what your costs are going to be. You know, um, let's say um, you have a dog walking business. What's your cost curves? You know, like how far you have to drive between walks, how much gas you need what kind of equipment, how much dog food, all those are going to be included in your marginal and average total cost curves. To predict costs accurately, we must determine the underlying relationship between variable cost and output. So, you know, going back to earlier stuff in the chapter, you know, how much do we need to put in to get X out? But the shape of the curve is what is most, uh, but the shape is what is most appropriate and how do we represent that shape algebraically? And it's showing that formula right here. I will not have you guys use this formula in an exam. Uh, the scale uh, economies index provides an index of whether or not there are scale economies. Um, this is probably a low likelihood question you'd show it, see in an exam. A cost function for electric power. Uh, consumers bought uh, 369 billion watts of electricity in 1955. By 1970, it had, uh, more, almost tripled. Um, was this due to an increase in economies of scales or something else? Um, if it was a result, result of economies of scale, it would be economically inefficient for regulators to, regulators to break up the electric utility monopolies. What is it saying there? Well, if you know these companies get more efficient by getting bigger, then it should be good for the consumer that they get bigger. What's saying here is that regulators found it was different. The average cost of electric power achieved a at a minimum of 20 billion, 20 billion kilowatt hours by 1970. The average cost of production had fallen sharply, and achieved a minimum of, uh, minimum at an output of 33 billion kilowatt hours. If there are two inputs, capital and labor, the production function, K and L, describes the maximum output that can be produced for every possible combination of units. So, you know, again, try not to focus on the complex formula below. All output is driven by a combination of labor and technology. We can skip this slide. This is more review slides for stuff that we covered. Same thing with this one. Cobb Douglas function is something that we'll cover in class, but production function, the Cobb Douglas function is again actually being covered here now. It's effectively that output is a function of capital and labor. When you see this right here, AK the symbol and then labor. That's all that is saying. So output is some combination of capital and labor. We can skip this slide.
We'll cover this more in greater detail in class. And then that will be the, it for this chapter.